say that um, my role and, and, and Stephen's role, as it hopefully will become clear during this uh, particular seminar and, and the two that will follow, uh, is that we, we are sort of leading the, the, the university sort of research strand of, of, of this strategy uh, and supporting um, the work of the, of, of the Greater Manchester Education and Employability Board, who um, set up the Pathways to Success programme. Uh, and and uh, shortly, we'll talk to you a little bit about that um, shortly. Okay, so um, yeah, just by way of a very brief in introduction from me, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pass over. We've got three, um, three presenters today, or three colleagues who are going to come and talk to you. Uh, and hopefully have a kind of discussion around uh, around the work that, that that we've all been engaged with um, over the last um, sort of year or so. But certainly this this fits in with the wider body of of, of research and activity that's been going on a lot longer than that. Uh, and and Mel will talk about that shortly. But we, we we've got with us today um, Ma Ma Margaret Woodhouse, who is the uh, the chair of the Greater Manchester Learning Partnership. Um, and Margaret will talk to you a little bit about what, what that learning partnership is and, what, and the work that they do, but it's essentially a, a, a group of educational stakeholders from across Greater Manchester that, that, that sort of work together to support education across, across the region, and they do some fantastic work. So we're very um, privileged to have Mar Margaret with us today and delighted that, that, that Margaret can join us. We've also got Professor Mel Ainsco, um, who is the Independent Chair of the Greater Manchester Education and Employability Board. And, and Mel might want to say a few words about what that board is and the work that they do and how that links with the work of the GM uh, LLP. Um, Mel's also a Professor of Education at the University of Glasgow uh, and as many of you will know, a Merit Professor at the University of Manchester and he continues to engage uh, I'd say more than ever in, 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 in educational issues across um, great, Greater Manchester um, educational um, equality. So uh, again, delighted to have, to have Mel with us today um, to share his insights on this work. Uh, and finally, um, uh, last but certainly not least, we've got uh, uh, Michael Tung, who's the CEO of, of Preston Lee Multi-Academy Trust. Uh, and again, Ma Ma Michael, like, like Mel and, and Margaret, is very much invested. In, in education across Greater Manchester and has been for, for a number of years. I won't reel off everything that Mike's, Michael's involved with because um, like Mel and Margaret, we'd probably take up more than the, the allocated hour that, we, that, we, that, we, that we've got. But, but Mike, Michael is involved as a member of the Greater Manchester Learning Partnership Steering Group. Um, he's also um, an, an Ofsted inspector and, and a member of the Northwest School Improvement board um, and he's also involved in the, the Greater Manchester Employability and Education Board as well. So um, again we're, 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 it's a great pleasure to, to have Michael with us. So um, th thanks Mel. So um, these two questions here that, that Mel's just put up uh, are very much um, they very much frame what this seminar series is about um, and so we'll keep re returning to the, those two questions um, as we go through today's session and also the, the, the next two seminars that, that Claire um, has, has just um, uh, detailed. So, so today we're going to kind of introduce to you what the Pathways to Success um, project is and what it's about and its evolution uh, and its sort of genealogy and, and where it's come from and, and what we're kind of all hoping to achieve from that and where we go next with it. Uh, next week, we're going to bring in some of the uh, practitioners that have been involved in that. Uh, so you'll be able to hear sort of some first-hand experiences of, of, of how colleagues across schools in Greater Manchester have been trying to sort of um, continue to provide educational um, and educational provision for their, for their students and their communities during what's been a, a really challenging period for everyone. Uh, and then in the final session, a couple of weeks, we're going to bring together a panel of, of, of colleagues, um, various uh, individuals from across um, the educational sphere um, in, in Greater Manchester to sort of reflect on what all this might mean for policy and practice in education going forward, not just in Greater Manchester, but also uh, further afield. So just keep these questions in mind as, as, as we go forward and we'll, we'll keep sort of referring to, to them. And I'm going to hand over to, to Mel now. Um, before I do, if anyone's got any questions at all as we're talking, just pop them in the chat and myself or Claire or my colleague Steve Rayner will we'll, we'll pick them up. We'll have plenty of time at the end to have a, hopefully have a bit of a discussion between the uh, sort of um, attendees and the presenters. Okay, Mel, over to you. Okay, thank you, Paul. So the running theme through these three discussions is how research and researchers can contribute to what's going on in the field, and particularly during this unprecedented period of challenge. Um, 
we don't want the discussion to become too academic, but there is obviously an academic uh, dimension to it. And of course, in terms of research, there are all sorts of different research goes on in education and certainly goes on in the University of Manchester. Uh, people who have different themes, different methodologies. But there's also differences in terms of stance. And there are a whole range of stances, but there are two I just want to, to sort of mention. One is, if you like, traditional research, researchers who do research on the system, on education, on what teachers and children are doing. That's a more traditional expectation. But the research that we're going to talk about today is mainly about a different stance, a stance where researchers are working in partnership with people in the field, with teachers, with people in local authorities, with other participants, including children and young people themselves. So it's a participatory kind of research. And that's what we're going to illustrate through the work that's gone on over the last year or so as part of this, what we call Pathways to Success. So the context is Greater Manchester, and I'm just conscious that there are a few people in the discussion from elsewhere, including, I think, one or two people at least from overseas. So just to say a little bit uh, about Greater Manchester, uh, obviously it's the centre of world football. We've now got the two best teams in the world playing here. Even I have to admit that the other one was better than my team, but nevertheless, it is a centre of world football. But more importantly, it's a city region, as we call it, with something like 2.8 million people. It has many, if not most, of the most disadvantaged communities in the country are in the city region of Greater Manchester, and that's quite important. But that said, it's rich in many other ways. It's a very diverse uh, region. Uh, there are some extremely wealthy families as well, of course, but there, it's diverse in all sorts of senses. We've got kind of in tremendous uh, differences in terms of communities, language, cultures, religion. Uh, in the city of Manchester, which is only part of the region, uh, they, they reckon that over 150 languages are spoken by children in the school, and something like 60% of Manchester school children are bil bilingual. What a fantastic resource that is, really. Um, the city region consists of 10 separate local authorities, each with their own rather grand town hall. So if you go to Rochdale or Oldham or Bury, all these, these boroughs have wonderful town halls and great sense of personal tradition. But over many years, the city region has a strong tradition of collaboration, not just in education, but in all sorts of things, economic and social developments. So it's a very interesting region probably compared with, with most of the rest of the United, the United Kingdom. So what we are talking about is a, a form of education collaboration, which is trying to work in that complex, diverse uh, uh, city region. Now, I won't bore you with this history other than to say it goes back a long time. And when I start tracing the history, I am reminded of how, how old I am really, but that, that there has been a strong tradition of schools and local authorities collaborating across the borders. And it's, it's not new. I mean, the starting point, as I'm concerned, coming from the university to be part of that, is probably about 2002. And there was an initiative at that time, which was called Excellence in Cities. And there were a number of cities across England that were part of that program. And it was very much about exploring in a research-like way, what more can be done to improve the educational experiences of children and young people from very disadvantaged uh, backgrounds. Now, a group of us from the university worked with a group of head teachers, and I'll just mention that because that idea keeps popping up in this discussion, people from the universities working with school leaders. And we worked with support from the government and with some government money around the leadership aspect of that uh, Excellent Cities programme. And we developed an idea that is central to everything we're going to talk about this afternoon. And that is the idea of schools from different parts of an area working together. And we created what were called LIGs, Leadership Improvement Groups, typically made up of four or six schools, and they were given extra funding and they were encouraged to develop one plan that they all implemented. Now, like all of these sort of centralized initiatives, it, it didn't work as well in some places as it did in other places, but it did work very well in some places. And we were able, because we were part of it, we were able to monitor it. What subsequently happened was a whole series of other initiatives happened in Greater Manchester based on similar thinking, the idea of collaboration between schools, across local borders, inquiry-based, collecting evidence, thinking about what else we can do, particularly in relation to those children and young people that we're not reaching at the moment. 
It possibly met its climax between 2008 and 2011, when we had the Greater Manchester Challenge, which followed on from the London Challenge. I was fortunate to be invited by government to be the chief advisor for all that. We were also fortunate in another sense because we had 50 million pounds to spend, which was quite head handy when we tried to get schools to collaborate. And it, the question of funding could be a flaw in everything we're talking about this afternoon. But in that City Challenge programme in London and in Greater Manchester, there was enormous emphasis on different forms of partnerships. We had what we call, for example, the families of schools. Typically, these were 10, 12 schools, again, across borders, brought together to see how they could support and help one another in searching for better ways of reaching those lead to, lead, leaders, uh, learners that we're not, not reaching. Since 2011, all of that momentum has continued. And uh, two or three years ago, Paul and I did a, a small study for the department on different areas of the country. And it wasn't our purpose, but we did come to the conclusion that the level of what we might call social capital, that's the sense of people crossing borders, sharing ideas, learning from one another, was clearly greater in Greater Manchester in other, than in other parts of the country. And it reflects that history and that tradition. And it's part of this, this story I'm going to tell. So that tradition has continued. And Margaret will come back to it in a moment when she talks about the Greater Manchester Learning Partnership, which was a legacy from City Challenge. So reflecting on all those experiences, I come to some sort of broad conclusions which have informed all of those initiatives and has certainly informed the, the project we're going to talk about this afternoon. The first thing is to say that our conclusion is, certainly my conclusion is, that this education system, and it's usually the case of other education systems that I've been part of, have untapped potential to improve themselves. So the focus is not bringing stuff from elsewhere. It's not saying what are they doing in London, what are they doing in Chicago? Not that we're opposed to learning from them, but saying there is the expertise here in the city region, and this is about making better use of it. The phrase I often use is, it's about moving knowledge around, moving knowledge around within schools and between schools. It's then about networking of various kinds, partnerships, different kinds of structures, and crucial to this, is the idea of crossing borders, using difference as a stimulus to think about what else can we do. The idea is that when you're hearing about something from somewhere else, some people who you don't know are doing something different, doing something interesting, that stimulates you to think about, well, maybe we can try other, some, some other ideas. Now, when I say cross-border networking, in those earlier projects, going right back to Exeter the cities, it was about crossing the borders of the 10 local authorities, but of course, rightly or wrongly, we now have other borders to cross. Of course, we've got the borders between the public and the private sector. We've got the, the borders between uh, maintained schools and faith schools. And now, of course, we've got the academies and the multi-academy trusts. So we've lots of borders that, if we're not very careful, constrain collaboration. And what I think we're going to describe to you is some quite successful experiences of showing how those borders have to be, can be crossed. Another conclusion that came from all of those experiences, this has to be led from within schools. It cannot, I'm sorry, Minister, be led from Westminster, even though often people in Westminster think they can do that. It can't really be led by local authorities, although I think they have a very local, local uh, important role to play. It has to come from within schools. And going right back to those earlier projects, in every case, myself and colleagues from the university linked up with people in schools, senior people, movers and shakers, people who can get th thing, things done. So that's part of what you're going to hear about in, in a moment. But of course, it has to be coordinated. There has to be some mechanism for making sure it's happening, making sure that people understand what it's about, getting the information across, capturing that information. So what we're going to describe to you is what's happened over the last year or so in Greater Manchester, building on that thinking to create an educational recovery strategy that will take our system forward and do so in a way where every learner matters. So the emphasis on equity is central to all of this. Margaret. I hope we've not lost her. I think you're on mute, Margaret. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I should have been quicker to tell you. Yeah, I'm going to pick up with where Mel left off in terms of the Greater Manchester Challenge, because 
what that gave us in Greater Manchester between 2008 and 2011 was a group of a, a group of leading head teachers. It was a move away from uh, local authority led systems to um, uh, school led systems, but at the same time recognizing that actually the two needed to work together. So we did establish a legacy group following uh, the challenge, which was called By Schools for Schools. And, and then as we moved towards the, um, the imperative of the school led system and the requirement for teaching schools to leave that system, because of our experiences in Greater Manchester, we fully recognised that whoever was meant to be leading the system, the only way to have an effective system, an effective school led system was to ensure that all other stakeholders were engaged. So GMLP was set up in 2015 and it brings together uh, the current teaching schools, the local authorities, the diocese and the various system leaders, um, national leaders of education, national leaders of governance. And as trusts have developed, it now incorporates the CEOs of all the trusts that work across Greater Manchester. So what it does is provides us with a communication mechanism to reach all the stakeholders in Greater Manchester in order to provide communication both ways, in order to be able to link to both regional and national initiatives, and also to begin or to continue to move that knowledge around through sharing expertise, sharing problems, uh, and, and sharing, um, uh, sharing solutions. Um, the Greater Manchester Challenge has an executive group, which is a core part of the Education and Employability Board uh, that Mel uh, chairs. And as we were um, dealing with the COVID, um, uh, our response to COVID across schools, it was recognised the importance that we needed to continue to work together for look, to look for solutions uh, around responses to COVID. I think we recognise um, that our, our schools uh, work together in various different ways they work with local authorities they work within clusters they work within uh, within their mats and have received significant support um, during covid from each of those organizations and indeed it's strengthened relationships quite uh, across the piece a great deal of knowledge and expertise therefore to move around the system and i think that's one of mel's favorite phrases isn't it moving knowledge around the system so um, when we came up through the Education and Employability Board Strategy Group with the plan for pathways to success, it was about taking that principle forward of moving knowledge around the system, of bringing together schools across Greater Manchester in different areas, but with similar, similar characteristics in terms of free school meals, in terms of ethnicity, so that they could share expertise, share ideas, share problems and share solutions and the bonus of having greater manchester learning partnership coordinating this is the capacity to communicate with every school across greater manchester through the various connections and um, so we initially um issued invites across the piece um across schools in greater manchester and in the initial phase um which was at second half of the autumn term we have about 80 schools uh, that signed up to that and with my colleague Phil Bezik who's, who's on the call we put those schools into groups of three. We then provided a script for them uh, and the script was focusing on the three P's as you'll see on the slides. First of all sharing information, expertise, problems and solutions around getting children into school and ensuring that they attend regularly. Secondly, ensuring that they are participating by ensuring that the climate provided with, within school is appropriate, that they feel welcome and valued, and that we identify and resolve uh, those barriers to learning that inevitably are intensified or have been intensified as a result of the, uh, of the COVID academic. COVID epidemic and then having dealt with getting them there, having dealt with removing the barriers to learning, then moving on to sharing information on strategies for 
progressing that learning, for accelerating that learning, and for identifying gaps, identifying positive solutions in terms of useful schemes, in terms of useful ideas uh, that schools have used across the piece and were able to share with each other. All of that being put together um, through a series of summary documents that the trios uh, completed and that then being uh, compiled into a, in, into a summary document that's been shared with every school in Greater Manchester. And I think that's my introduction, uh, Mel. I think we're going to move on to uh, Mike, our practitioner, Chalk Face, uh, who's going to carry on uh, talking well, about... Well, to be honest, Margaret, I think Chalk Face is a little harsh, given the grey hair. <laughs> I'm, just saying, I'm just putting it out there at this point. Um, just before my sort of preamble, when I first became a head teacher, I was uh, told the best piece of advice I got was to um, always do what you want to do, because at least one person in the organisation is happy with what's going on. Um, and it, it seemed to be a sort of reasonable way of going about leading a school. What are the, what are the statement? What are the, what's telling about that statement is that it tells you that leadership and management, teaching, NQT, RQT, middle leaders, senior leaders, whatever it is, is actually an intelligence led profession. It is driven by your intellectual construct around what you should do, why you should do it, and when you should do it. Given that intellectual context and adding the emotional sense that we're all in at the moment and your emotional state and your emotional sense of being, you create a view of what school should be, how you should respond to it, and what should happen next. Now, given that, placing it in the context with which we experience our work and placing it in the context of what we do, it determines far too often our own individual response to aspects of leadership, management, how we deal with crisis, how we deal with individuals, how we deal with structures, how we approach things intellectually and emotionally. Now, the purpose of this was in many cases to actually say, there's a lot of research out there, have you considered it? There's a lot of good practice out there. Have you considered it? And how do we challenge ourselves as leaders, as schools, as organizations to actually look at what does the evidence tell us is the best and most effective practice? Not what exists in our own internal construction, but what does the evidence tell us that actually challenges our own internal constructions, our own internal views, our own immediate go-to responses? And then what is that wider experience that we can draw upon, that we can bring to the work that we do, that can engage us, actually tell us we can do to change, to move forward, to adopt, to develop our own practice, particularly when you're moving through a process which is very much logistic led, but then logistics led to learning led and learning led to curriculum led. That process is taking some time. So the whole point of Pathways to Success was to bring this experience, this shared research, this shared sense of knowledge, this shared sense of collaboration to trade and engage with an understanding of the evidence and the best practice that sits within the system to help schools do better, to help schools cope through very difficult circumstances and very difficult challenges. Now, the whole point of that was actually you need central coordination to make that work. You need central coordination to bring all these partners together, to bring this evidence together, to bring this experience and practitioners together, to create this collaborative. So there was this local strategy group, which actually brought people together, and I think really effectively. I think it's the uh, next slide, please. So again, that actually this notion that schools can learn very much from each other, where using the script that Margaret had provided to all of the schools was merely a stimulus for that discussion. But actually, you needed that structure to get the stimulus going, to get the discussion going. And actually, one of the things about that context is that every school thinks their context is unique. You know, I inspect, um, I inspect lots of schools and every single school tells me that all of their children on entry start well below national. They tell me that every school I go into is unique and you'll never understand it. And they tell me that you'll never actually be able to get to the bottom of our school in the two days that you're there. But by drawing these schools together, by looking at context and trying to draw in the similarities together and trying to create groups of, of, of schools that were you know, statistically uh, and uh, environmentally similar, 
you had a group that could operate and had a shared knowledge base, a shared context, a shared language for discussion. And then over time, this has grown where you've got actually around 80s Manchester schools involved in this and working on this and working through that, having lots of online meetings, but that as a stimulus for discussion, as a challenge for thinking, as a call to action, has been massively helpful in terms of supporting and engaging with those schools as we go through that process. And I think the next slide, please. So this is mine, isn't it? I'm just saying it's mine. Um, is that when you're, when you're looking at that, one of the things that's really come out strongly is that many of the answers to the problems in the system exist within the system. And actually drawing that out really important and about how we actually say that actually all of this knowledge and skills and ability and understanding that's in the system we can move it from place to place so that we can actually raise the intellectual level of our work raise the intellectual level of discussion and have a direct impact so no disconnect between research and challenge to having a direct impact on the lives of the pupils that we're trying to improve, you know, on developing their context, getting them into school, making them not simply present, but participators in their own education process. And that's been a real aspect of that. And this learning trio is what we're starting to see is the learning trios are really developing, engaging and growing and taking some of that work forward and actually some new networks of practice has actually started to take place with that. And, you know, we're looking forward to the impact being evaluated. It's back to me and I've remembered to unmute. Um, we did a, a first report um, in, well, I think uh, Phil and I wrote it over our Christmas holidays, but it was it was out in January and you'll find it on the uh, Greater Manchester Learning website and there's a there's a reference there. Um, what that report does is show something that Mel and I discovered many years ago when we were working over in the Northeast, that actually when you put, we put some schools together over there that were RI schools, thinking that we would get them to identify what support they needed externally. But what we discovered was that working together across the piece, they all had different strengths and between them, they could support each other without the need for any significant external help. And I think that's one of the, one of the joys of any piece of work that we do uh, in this way where we put schools together is, there is so much knowledge and expertise in the system and every school has something to offer. So that report is on the website. It's been circulated, um, it, it's been circulated to every school. From there, um, some of those trios have engaged with Paul and Stephen, and then they will be, I think that's the focus very much of next week's meeting. So they have followed, followed those up. In addition, we launched a, a second programme of meetings for the first half term of the summer term. This time we had a well over 100 schools involved and that report will be out hopefully by the end of next week. Uh, and what we saw there was an increasing enthusiasm um, of schools to be involved, more schools involved than previously. The evidence that those schools that had been involved in the first uh, uh, series of meetings had been meeting, communicating between themselves much easier actually to meet virtually than it would have been to arrange uh, arrange separate visits and finding the value of talking uh, to um, head teachers senior staff outside of their local area uh, I'm, I'm just going to uh, uh, read you a couple of comments um, that i got um, on asking colleagues to return their summary sheets to me which, which were the summary sheets that, that informed the report. And we got comments like a really fruitful discussion, everyone willing to share practice, some really good ideas generated. And my favorite, somebody described their meeting as an oasis of pragmatism and joy, <laughs> helpful and reassuring in equal measure. Um, so that is the value of bringing people together across the piece and getting them to share their expertise, their problems and their solutions. So, 
Thank you, Mark. So more detail on that next week when we will have some teachers and school leaders joining us to tell more about the sorts of things that they've done through the trios that they form. We call them action learning trios because that's what they're doing, learning together in an active way. Uh, and we, we hope you will join us next week to hear you know, the story from, from the, the field, so to speak. Now, running through that account, as I, I hope you sensed, is a preoccupation with inquiry, with evidence, with thinking about what else we can do. So reflecting on the contributions of research and research thinking and researchers, including those of us from the University of Manchester and over those last almost 20 years now, there's been a whole crowd of us at different stages involved. I kind of reflect on what we think we've learned about all of that. The first thing to say is about stance. I mentioned that earlier. Some of you will be familiar with the great uh, hit show Hamilton, so it's uh, coming back in, 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 in London shortly. Um, and one of the great songs is that, The Room Where It Happens. Well, I think for those of us who are interested in the kind of questions I'm interested in, it's no use of sitting in our offices. It's no use being on the internet. We have to be in the room where it happens. We have to be out there in the field, very difficult at the moment, being part of what's going on and learning as we go. I think one of the things that we do by being there and the kind of almost incidental contributions we make is we encourage an inquiring stance. And it seems to me that one of the features of very effective schools, schools that are always on the move, is they have an inquiring stance. They're constantly asking questions. They're constantly saying, what else can we do? Of course, we have other tangible contributions where it becomes apparent that there is an area of interest, then either we know some formal research or because of our connections within the university, we know people who do have access to formal research and we will act, uh, we will bring that into, into the discussion. I think we act as critical friends and the phrase critical friends, just to remind you, doesn't mean being critical. It means raising questions, challenging our thinking. And I think, you know, it's part of our training, if you will, as academics to be involved in that kind of thing. And then, of course, occasionally we stop and take a more formal stance. We step back so our stance changes and we capture and, and share the knowledge that has been generated through a project like this. And of course, we are accountable in the same way people in schools are. We have our league tables, so we have to publish. And so we write about what we're doing. And that's what Stephen and Paul are, are currently doing from a sort of standing on the side position. They have been holding uh, uh, group interviews with some of the teachers involved in the processes that Margaret and, and Mike have talked about, and they'll report at that in the next meeting. So I, I think this sort of sums up for me the kind of areas that I think we're talking about. Just finally then, I think there are some important implications to all of this to make it work. And I, I pinched these quotes from some American researchers who are involved in this kind of working with practice in the field. Um, and they argue that for it to work, there has to be changes in thinking on both sides, if you will. And as you read what you say there, what, what it requires is teachers and other practitioners have got to recognize that they have to make their practice public. And it's a bit risky having somebody come in your classroom, having somebody asking you questions, asking, having somebody coming to you as the head teacher asking you questions. But people have to make it, make it public, if you will, in order to create the kind of discussion. You see, I think part of what we've explored in this, and it will come up in the later seminars, is that practitioners, for all sorts of understandable reasons, find it difficult to tell us what they do. They're too busy doing it. They haven't got time to think about how do I explain it to somebody else? Now, I think working with outsiders, in this case, people from another school, forces you to articulate what you do. Colleagues from another school will ask you questions and things that you take for granted need talking about. So we need that change in perspective within the profession of teachers. But then I think there are very important and challenging uh, things which those of us in the academy, those of us working in universities, have to think about as well. We have to recognise that the colleagues we work with in the schools, in the education systems, they have expertise that we don't have. You know, uh, I, I, over many years, I've worked with networks of schools on kind of collaborative inquiry. And often when I'm having meetings with people in a school, at some point, somebody will turn around to me and say, well, you're a professor, you're the expert, tell us what to do. And I often say, well, listen, put me in front of one of your classes, you know, put, 
put me in a class and you'll see what kind of expert I am. You know, maybe I could do a bit of teaching decades ago, but that's not my expertise. So I think as researchers, we have to respect and understand that there is knowledge there that we don't have, that we have to somehow get hold of, get it articulated and record and help in the process of moving things around. So that's where we're at so far. There's more to follow in the other two seminars, but Paul, perhaps you'd like to stimulate our discussion about all of this. Thanks, Mel, and, and, and thanks also to, to, to Michael and, and, and Margaret for your uh, contributions there. Um, I think we've covered an awful lot of, of ground there. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it, 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 it sort of really gets the heart of what, what we've been trying to, what you guys have been, have been trying to set up here and what we've been trying to support you in doing uh, from the, the university. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I've got a couple of questions that I'd like to kind of ask, but would anyone else like to sort of step in from the, from the, uh, from the participants? Has anyone got anything they'd like to kind of ask the, the, the presenters at this point? People can show their hand if they want. Can't they they can show their hand, they can put something in the chat. I'm happy to kick things off if not. Don't be shy. Or maybe comments, is it other than questions yeah. perhaps? Comments, thoughts, perspectives? Yeah. Okay, well, while, while colleagues are thinking about that, I'll, I'm happy to, to kick things off. So I think as, from my perspective, as, as, as a kind of relative outsider to the, to the, the teaching profession, as, as, as a researcher as, uh, that would sit within that second quote that Mel's got up there on the screen. Um, and it's been quite interesting. I've, I've been work, working in academia for you know sort of nearly twenty years now, and I've, I've always been kind of quite preoccupied with this notion of, of, of collaboration and professional collaboration, um, and, and professionals working together to try and get better at what they do and support one another. Um, but it's always fascinated me, in, 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 particularly in the, in the school system in, in this country and others in which I've worked across the world as well. But I think England is a is a good example of where we have we have such a, a competitive element. Um, between schools to, to, to our system. You know, the, the school system in England is such a sort of vibrant sort of marketplace, if you like, that schools are very much, they're not just encouraged to, to compete with other schools. Uh, they're held, a, held a, to account on, on how well they do that. Um, and so I always find it, uh, you know, interesting, fascinating, a little bit peculiar that, you know, that we have um, a kind of, you know, often have a government discourse that and a policy discourse that promotes collaboration and that talks about the importance of collaboration but actually we have an accountability system that actually uh, does the opposite and so I, I, I wonder what the uh, what, what, what the presenters might, might think about particularly Michael um, um, given his, his, his varied roles as, uh, as practitioner um, school leader and, and officer inspector what his, th his thoughts are on the potential of a collaboration at scale and this, the kind of work that we're trying to kind of promote and, and create the conditions for in Manchester and, and, and whether, you know, what, what, what you think the, the, the potential of that is going, going forward realistically, given those uh, accountability structures. Um, I think there's no doubt that accountability is a real issue, um, that accountability and the accountability system that currently exists across the education system uh, set schools up into competing organisations. I think also this notion of a fractured system it doesn't have to be a fractured system. If you could separate out the way that schools are governed, whether it's an academy governance structure, a faith governance structure, a maintained governance structure, it doesn't have to be like that. And there's a will, I think, within the system to actually collaborate, but it's to collaborate for what purpose? It's to collaborate to what end, to collaborate to what engagement? And it takes proper glue in the system to encourage schools to collaborate. But once they do, the value of it's enormous, but all the time you're sitting there thinking to yourself, how is this adding value to the school organization, which I am doing? How will this help me get through my accountability framework? Now, if you were wanting to get, there was, there was a discussion for a period of time that any kind of Ofsted framework would have an expectation that schools would collaborate as part of being an excellent yeah. school. If you get away from the notion of outstanding, good, da, 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 and you think about what's exemplary practice, 
Well, exemplary practice is actually collaboration in the best interest of all the pupils, drawing together the best practice, challenged by the best research to improve the quality of the system. It's almost like if you have local improvement, you can have national engagement and national development. Um, but I think what's happened with COVID particularly is the accountability framework has not been there. And what we've seen for the first time in a long time is the number of schools coalescing around local authorities, coalescing into engagement groups, coalescing into new partnerships. Um, what I'd hope is that that's developed over time as opposed to we go back into our silo thinking. Does that answer some of that? Yeah, it very much does so. And I think it, it kind of aligns with what I, I spoke to Mel and, and Stephen Rayner about throughout all of this is that I think, you know, there's an opportunity here, isn't there, in amongst all the chaos and, and the sort of despair and the tragedy that we've had over the last 18, 18 months. Um, there's, there's an opportunity here, isn't there, to sort of do things differently. Um, and, and hopefully we, we, we can grasp that. Th thank you, Michael. Um, as I was asking the question, as you were responding, we've had a few hands have been raised. Uh, I'm going to go to the first one. I apologise uh, to, to this participant. Y your name is up as DDRR, so I've no idea what your name is. I presume <laughs> that's not your name, but uh, you've got your hand up and you've waited very patiently. So please, please go ahead. Hi, Paul. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't get my name to change. I'm Debs Robinson. I'm from the University of Derby. OK, um, very welcome, Debs. Go ahead. Thank you, Paul. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments um, and then raise a question, if I may. So the comments really are first to say congratulations because this project in Greater Manchester is so cohesive and principled and has such important impact and I think the thing about the project is it does stand again for this message about collectivism and partnership um, and the the benefit that can come from universities working in partnership with schools and local authorities in their local area. Um, the three P's are so magical as, a, as an explanation of what it is we should be focusing on. And um, so congratulations to everyone on that. Um, and I suppose the other comment I'd like to make is that, and I thank Mel for supporting us with understanding the significance of this actually, is we have something similar working in the city of Derby. Uh, you know, so it's about partnership, it's about, I love this phrase, moving the knowledge around, it's about respecting the knowledge that's in schools. Um, it's different in that it's focused specifically on SEND, and it doesn't use kind of collaborative inquiry, it uses peer review as its main driver. And, and what's interesting about it is the Department for Education like it. And they've started using words like cooperation, collectivism, and these kind of things. And they're interested in Derby, the, the locality becoming um, an advisor for other you know, counties that are close to, to us. So, you know, I think this is pivotal. You know, so, so um, I think it's pivotal. So I also wanted to say that I really loved what you said, Michael, about intellect. Uh, because there's so much evidence, isn't there, that inclusion as an educational um, pursuit is about ethical labour, it's about emotional labour, it's about practical labour, but it's also a matter of intellectual labour. And that's something that I have, have argued um, in my own reflections on this. So, so thank you for saying that, because I just went, yes, uh, thank you for that. So I suppose the question I would like to ask is, if there are a number of these localised partnerships across our country and internationally, um, how can we come together to broadcast their modus and their impact in ways that can help us resist some of the discourses of accountability that are about isolation um, and defence? Thanks, Debs. Uh, excellent question. Um, Mel, do you want to pick that one up? Um, no, no, thanks, Debs. Uh, I, I mean, I know that there are developments in other parts of the country, and, uh, uh, and uh, I think I'd want to stress, it's implicit in what we've said, is in all of this, context matters. What can we can do in Greater Manchester, given that history, given that diversity, given the size of it all, it's going to look different in Derby, it's going to look different in Cornwall, so context matters, but I think the ideas and the principles are the same. You know, it's the same ideas, same thinking, bring people together. 
get, you know, I, I'm reminded of Michael Fullan, you know, the great guru of educational change. He says educational change because people don't understand the meaning. So a simple device like the three P's, apart from the fact that it, it tells you something that's important, it actually is all a kind of a flag, a mantra that people can rally behind. So I, I think what you're suggesting, Deb, is that and one or two other people have said this, our, our, our colleague Phil, who's on the, the, the line, he's been doing some work on this. We need to find ways now of linking the different regions of the country and let's bring them all together and let's tell our stories and uh, see if we can learn from one another because I think there's a lot to learn. And then learn internationally as well, I think, in, in what's going on. Margaret, you've got your hand up. Do you want to come in on that? I just wanted to emphasise the point that I think um, kind of more widely than this particular project that we're talking about, is that ironically COVID has strengthened partnerships and has opened people's eyes to the negative aspects of fragmentation of the system and it has encouraged schools to work together and most importantly across Greater Manchester we've been having regular meetings where the, um, where the CEOs of the trusts um, have been meeting with the local authorities in the diocese. And I think we really do need to hold on to this recognition that we're all stronger together and, and build on it um, rather than kind of going back to working the way we were before. And I think the way that we have been working in the trios and across borders is helping to enmesh that work. And, and, and it will be important that we, we that we carry on with it. Th th thanks, Margaret. Uh, Michael, I'm just going to come to you, and then we've got a couple of questions in the in the chat as well. But I'll come to you first, Michael, because I assume this is relating to what we've been talking about in this little. Yeah, I just I just want to say what, what's what's really interesting is the discourse around policy, which exists at the moment around COVID catch up, and COVID catch up policy. The tutoring, the expectation is is that. A lot of it is about the accountability framework. It is not about intellectually driven curriculum or school improvement. It's about how can we get the results up? How can we get the maths and literacy results up? How can we get the GCSE grades up? The focus and disconnect between policy and an opportunity to have a wider intellectual debate about what is of value in education. And that discussion, and, and Mel, I think, and, and Margaret will, get, will have got a sense of this from the Pathways to Success, has been much wider and it's been much more about what is valuable in education beyond delivering on simply activity that drives forward outcomes in an accountability framework. So actually I think thinking in schools is way beyond that which is driving policy which by its very nature is oversimplified and I think the kinds of intellectual discussions that Mel and his team have been facilitating across Greater Manchester has raised the discourse beyond accountability and delivering on policy and it's much more about what matters and what can we do to placate policy as opposed to uh, simply activate our work around policy. Th thanks, Michael. That, that's 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 really great. Thank you, and 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 thanks, Deb, for that um, that, that question that's got everybody um, kind of talking. Um, G Evans, I apologise. I don't know what the G stands for. Um, I can read the question out, but uh, would you like to uh, would you like to ask it audibly, or do you want me to just you can you'll mute if you want? Good afternoon, Hello, Paul. Thank you for that. Um, Hi. Uh, Gareth, uh, Gareth. I was going to say Gareth. I yeah, distinctly yeah. wanted to say Gareth, but I thought I better not guess. And yeah, get it wrong. I'm a, uh, a classic Welsh name. Yeah, just in keeping with my surname as well. I'm from the University of Trinity St David down here in uh, Swansea. Uh, um, very interested by your work, at least not because we're looking to do and have done very similar uh, collab collaborative work here in Wales. There's, there's very much a culture of collaboration here now that there wasn't. Uh, perhaps in previous years. And my, my question really relates to that relationship but between the centre in whatever form that might be, whether that be uh, academics, whether that be the so-called middle tier, local authorities, whatever it might be, uh, and the, the, the chalk face that we referred to earlier, the schools. Um, clearly there needs to be some sort of coordination and there was a discussion earlier around the, the, the central coordination of this work. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a slightly uneasy relationship, isn't it, in that you don't want to direct and prescribe and lead too much. Uh, you want this work to be very much school focused and practitioner led. So it was just a flavour really as to how you've managed that relationship. 
Mel, yeah, Margaret, yeah. I think you, yeah. probably, you might be best placed to initially respond to those. Hi, Gareth. It's nice to see you. It's a long time since we had the beer in Cardiff, I remember. Um, I think to remind, I mentioned it earlier, context matters. And, you know, having worked in Wales alongside you for a while, and more recently in Scotland, be in no doubt the three local, the three governments are running the education systems in very different ways. And what you could do in Wales, you can't do in Scotland, and you can't do in England. And the question of the role of the middle tier, as they call it in the international literature, I think that what we are seeing in Greater Manchester and probably in other parts of England is a, a, an exploration of a new kind of middle tier. And the local authorities have an important role to play in it, if I'm convinced, but it's not doing what they did in the past. You know, they're not in command, they're not in control. I think they're there to act as the conscience of the system, keeping an eye on the thing, having a big picture. But the leadership for this, being no question, is coming from head teachers. We have a group of very powerful head teachers. We met Mike, we'll meet one, some of those ones later. The, these people are, um, use the phrase earlier, these are movers and shakers. These people get things done. Now, the local authorities have had to reposition themselves. I remember when we were doing the Greater Manchester Challenge, we were having a bit of a dispute with uh, senior officers at one point at a meeting. And one of the very successful senior officers said, look, colleagues, let's get this clear. It's quite simple. The job of schools is to improve themselves. Our job is to make sure it happens. And I, I've taken that with me and I've used it in all sorts of places. I think it's right. The only people who can improve schools are people in the schools. But I do, th I do think there has to be a coordination. And I think the kind of movement we're making, still at an early stage, where we have this kind of horizontal partnership with senior people in the schools, including the multi academy trusts, um, people from the local authorities. We've also had engagement with the regional schools commissioner who represents government in all of this. I think we're exploring that. And I think with a bit of help and support, we could take that even further. And that might be a kind of a design that could be replicated in other parts of the country. Margaret, do you want to come on this? I just wanted to say that I think we're fortunate in Greater Manchester that we have got had a long history of collaboration in various different ways. Some of it prompted by funding that always gets things going. But, but I think at each stage, certainly from the challenge onwards, a recognition that schools could not, could not lead the school-led system without the support and the coordination and the knowledge of local authorities. That actually through COVID, trusts have realised that whilst they may be able to work across groups of schools in different local, local areas, they also need to work with the local authority areas as well in terms of the geographical pattern. And, and, I, and, and, and I do think that there is significant mutual respect um, across Greater Manchester and that because of our history and the way we've developed and thank you very much to the challenge of which Mel was an integral part and, and I was, was also quite heavily involved, um, that we have developed that trust and that understanding and that mutual respect for the respective roles of each of the partners within the system. Um, and we need to carry on working on that because, you know, there is the potential uh, now for further fragmentation with the ending of the teaching school funding, the development of the teaching school hubs, the question marks over the future of teaching school council, system leaders, etc. cetera. Um, it's important that we continue to work together to support each other um, and to show mutual respect. And I think we've got that in Greater Manchester at the moment. We have to keep working on it. Th thanks, Margaret. Michael, uh, uh, briefly um, over to you, and then we've got what, what, one more Very quickly, I think all we can do is get the right people around the table to have a discussion, but ultimately, what we're looking to do is to create the conditions under which others can succeed. Uh, and that's all you can do. But creating those conditions in the ecosystem of Greater Manchester means far more people have the opportunity to, to succeed and to engage. Yeah, I, I, I think that's... I think that's absolutely right. And I think, you know, from our, our perspective as researchers, you know, we, we've long known that there's a great appetite within the system for colleagues to work together and work across school boundaries, but they, you know, they need support to help create the spaces in which that could, which that can happen. So um, I think that links back to those initial questions and the, perhaps the role that the university and colleagues like ourselves 
or a GM LP might have in, in helping uh, to make that happen. Um, Tony, um, you, you raised an observation about, uh, about COVID uh, and the COVID imperative. Do you want to um, just bring that in? Absolutely. Uh, so it's reiterating a couple of the points that have already been made. Uh, I think COVID's enabled um, me, I'm a local authority uh, representative, uh, to have a different role. Um, I've seen local authorities collaborating on a far more uh, dynamic basis as a, uh, as a consequence of need, and they work with all the other organisations uh, that, that have been mentioned. But well, my point, actually, I was just about to make is Manchester, when I was young, uh, and, and I'm not too old, when I was young, Manchester United and City both spent times in Division Two. Now they're both the two best teams in the world, arguably. Uh, where do we go from our education system now to having the best education system in the world? Great question, Tony. Thank you. Would anyone like to uh, of the of the presenters? <laughs> Mel seems to be ready to respond. Well, I, I mean, we're getting towards the end, really. But I mean, that we could have another series of seminars around that question. I think that, I mean that's that's the big question, isn't it? Really, I, I have the privilege of working in different parts of the world in education systems. And currently, I'm working in, in, for example, in Portugal. And I mean, it's fascinating to see the way in which what seems like a similar thing can look so different in different cultures and different traditions, different histories, and so on. Um, and each has its own strengths and, and, and concerns and problems, really. What I would say about the English education system, um, some parts of it scare me to death, I have to say. The fragmentation, the way in which we are losing kids and kids are being left out, left behind, you know, we, we, it, some of it is absolutely disgraceful. But what I would say is, it's probably the education system that I've had contact with in the last few years that has the greatest potential for innovation. This, this kind of uncertainty and, uh, and the changes that are coming, and it's not just this government, go back to the, you know, the Labour government and so on. The, the, the change after change has created a system that has a remarkable capacity to innovate. And I think we certainly see that in Greater Manchester. Some people are doing some marvellous things in schools, in multi-academy trusts, in, in local authority groups in the primary sector, for example, and so on. And I just think we've got to find a way of orchestrating that and learning from it. And again, to use the phrase, move that knowledge around. And that's why I think people from universities have a crucial role to play in all of this. As we've been listening in this last 60 minutes, I'm thinking about, I could write this up, I could write that up and, and get it into the system really. So I, 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 we have a long way to go and we've lots of problems, but we have great strengths to build on, you know, and I think we, we, we need to remind ourselves of that and celebrate that. Thanks, Mel. We, we are bang on five o'clock uh, and I can see uh, Claire's put up a uh, helpful message in the chat there that colleagues might want to just take a quick look at. Um, it'd be great if you could join us for the next two sessions. Uh, they are linked. Uh, there will be coherence between them and they should follow on and build upon the discussions that we've had. Um, as I said, next week we're going to be talking to and hearing from some of the practitioners who've been involved in this. Um, which I think you know their voices are, are, are more important than 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 than, than ever. Um, they're both uh, as thank you, Stephen. Both of the sessions are on Wednesday, so it's next Wednesday and then the Wednesday after. But if you follow uh, the link that Claire sent out, and please do share the link amongst any of your networks and your colleagues as well. Uh, please spread the word. It'd be great to get um, some more people um, in attendance, so we can you know spread the word and, and share what, what's going on. Um, uh, amongst a, a great number, number of colleagues. Um, that, uh, after, after saying that, could I just say a massive thank you to Mel and Margaret and Michael for, um, for sharing their thoughts and their insights today. Um, it's always great to hear from you and uh, you know, I appreciate that you're uh, sparing your, 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 your time with us and your insights. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, and a massive thank you to Claire as well, uh, our colleague from the University of Manchester, who's coordinated all of this and pulled it all together. We, we wouldn't be able to have done this without you. So thanks, Claire. Claire will be with us for the next two sessions as well. And Claire, I understand this has been recorded and it will be going up on YouTube, will it, or some, somewhere like that? Yeah, yeah, it will be recorded and I'll send you all the link tomorrow when I send out the slides and other information. And okay, can I great. So again, thank you for chairing the session? You thanked everyone. Oh, yes. thank, you, thank you for chairing the session so beautifully. 
Okay, thank you very much. Okay, all right, colleagues, I think that's all. We've just gone five o'clock. I don't want Mel to miss the kickoff of the Portugal game. So uh, <laughs> on that note, uh, great to see you all. Th thanks everyone for your, for your input um, and, and, and hopefully we'll see you all next Wednesday. Okay, take care everyone. Uh, yeah, speak to you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.